Steve Jobs came kind of came bopping by my cubicle saying, okay, you're working on the Mac now. And I said, uh, well, I have to finish up this Apple II stuff I'm doing. He goes, no, you don't. That stinks. That's not going to amount to anything. You got to start now. And I said, well, just, get, just give me a few days to finish. And he said, no. And what he did was he pulled the plug on my Apple II uh, that I was programming, just losing, losing the code I'm working on, and starts taking my computer and walking away with it. And what could I do but follow him out to his car? Because uh, he had my, my machine. He plopped it down in the trunk, drove me over to this remote building, took the computer out, walked upstairs, plopped it down on a desk, saying, well, you're working on the Mac now. While Jobs pursued his Mac mission, he needed a more orthodox chief executive to run the company, a respectable face who could sell to corporate America. He chose Pepsi-Cola executive John Scully. Scully refused. Leave Pepsi for a four-year-old company that had been set up in a garage? Are you serious? But it was hard saying no to Steve Jobs. And then he looked up at me and just stared at me with this stare that only Steve Jobs has. And he said, do you want to sell sugar water for the rest of your life? Or do you want to come with me and change the world? And I just gulped because I knew I would wonder for the rest of my life. You know, what I would have missed. It didn't do very much. We had Mac Paint and Mac Write, uh, were our, our only applications. And the market started to figure this out. Um, by the end of the year, people said, well, maybe the uh, IBM PC isn't as easy to use or is not as attractive as the Macintosh, but it actually does something which we want to be able to do, spreadsheets, word processing, and database. And so we started to see the sales of the Mac tail off towards the end of 1984, um, and, and that became a problem the following year. the grandiose plans of what Macintosh were going to be was just so far out of whack with the truth of what the product was doing. And the truth of what the product was doing was not horrible. It was salvageable. But the gap between the two was just so unthinkable that somebody had to do something, and that somebody was John Scully. John Scully, whom Jobs saw as his own creation, presented the board with his strategy to save the company. The plan did not include Steve Jobs. The, the board had to make a, a choice, and I said, look, it's Steve's company. Uh, I was brought in here to help, you know. Uh, if you want him to run it, that's fine with me. Um, but, you know, we've got to at least decide what we're going to do, and everyone's got to get behind it. But he took it as a personal attack, uh, started attacking Scully, uh, in which created, you know, backed himself into a corner, because uh, he was sure that the board would support him and not Scully. And um, ultimately, after the board talked with Steve and talked with me, um, the decision was that we would um, go forward with um, my plans, and Steve left. Um, what can I say? I hired the wrong guy. That was Scully? Yeah. And uh, he destroyed everything I'd spent 10 years working for, um, starting with me. But that wasn't the saddest part. Uh, I would have gladly left Apple if Apple would have turned out like I'd wanted it to. People in the company had very mixed feelings about it. Everyone had been terrorized by Steve Jobs at some point or another, and so there was a certain relief that the terrorist would be gone. And on the other hand, I think there was incredible respect for Steve Jobs by the very same people. And we were all very worried what would happen to this company without the visionary, without the founder, without the, char without the charisma. Apple never recovered from losing Steve. Steve was the heart and soul and driving force. It would be quite a different place today. Uh, they lost their, uh, their soul. Ironically, the years after Jobs left were Apple's most profitable.
successful people worked hard, they played hard. They made the computer business look like a beach party. And with a median age of 27, the company was very sexy too. Maybe too sexy. There was so much sleeping around that they came up with a travel policy back then that men would share rooms with other men on the road and women with other women just to settle it down a bit. They applied the California lifestyle to the computer industry, and the computer industry would never be the same again. Leading the forces of freedom is Macintosh. In this bizarre promo to inspire their sales force, Apple stressed that the Mac's ease of use could liberate the pathetic prisoners of the IBM PC. We'll fight them in the office and the classroom and the desktop with superior weapons. With improvements to the hardware and the boom in desktop publishing, Mac production went into overdrive. By 1987, Apple was selling a million a year, IBM numbers. Let's go get them. The Mac minted money. Half its $2,000 price was pure profit. Apple arrogantly assumed their stuff was so good, consumers would always pay a premium for it. Big mistake. The Mac really ought to have won the battle for the desktop. Okay, it was more expensive than an IBM PC, but if what you wanted was a friendly, easy-to-use system, and surely everyone wanted that, then this was the only game in town. At least that's what the boys at Apple thought. But they weren't reckoning on one man. Bill Gates. Gates saw that the Mac's GUI represented a long-term threat to Microsoft's money machine, to DOS, the clunky operating system that sat inside every IBM PC. So Bill had his boys create a GUI that sat on top of DOS, rather like building a fancy facade on an old building. They called it Windows, and it wasn't much at first, but it was good enough to defend the DOS franchise. February or March of 1984, which was just right after the Apple Macintosh, had been introduced. And at that point in time, it was, we were firmly convinced that we needed to bet on graphic user interface, first with the Macintosh and then with Windows. At Microsoft, it was a long and often frustrating struggle to find a GUI solution that challenged the Mac. I know the feeling. For years, teams of Microsofties slaved in their windowless offices to build windows, refreshed by an endless supply of free sodas. And I was the development manager for Windows 1.0, and you know we kept slogging and slogging, and yeah, it took us I don't know about seven versions, but it took a few versions to get things right before 1990. That's right.